There are some investments, your car, that eat up all of your money. And then there are some investments, real estate, that put more money in your pocket. The reason why you invest your money is so you can be financially free and do the things that you want without having to worry about money. But all investments don't work the same. If you really never want to have to worry about money again, you need three different types of investments. You need an investment that's going to pay you with income. You need an investment that's going to give you growth of your wealth. And then you need an investment that's going to protect your money. So what I want to do today is go over the three investments that you need to make that way you don't have to worry about money ever again starting with number one which is investing in real estate for income traditionally when people talk about making a passive investment for income they talk about investing their money into the stock market into a dividend paying company so you look for a company like mcdonald's that's been paying a good dividend you invest your money into mcdonald's and then every quarter mcdonald's is going to give you a dividend check but i prefer real estate rental income and i'm going to show you why real estate is the best place to generate passive cash flow the way it works is you can go out and buy a property. This can be a house, this can be an apartment building, this can be a mixed use building. You go out and you buy this property, this building, and then you're going to lease it out to somebody else who's going to use your building. So in this case, we'll use a house. And now I'm going to lease it out to this nice person with a mustache with his wife who has a braid or as we like to call it in my native language, Punjabi, a gut. This nice couple live in my home. Now in exchange for them living in my home and using my home, they're going to pay me $1,500 a month every single month for living in this property. I don't have to do any work after they move into the property because now I already own the asset. I'll give you another example of this. The Minority Mindset Company's office right here is two floors and I pay $4,300 a month to lease our office space. So this is money going to the landlord. I don't really see the landlord ever, but I give him a check every single month and this is money that he uses to pay the mortgage for this building and put some money in his pocket every single month. The reason why I say real estate is the best place to generate this type of passive cash flow is because for one, if you do it right, you're going to be able to rent it out to somebody else. And this rent that you get is going to cover your expenses, your taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees, and it's going to put some money in your pocket every single month. And if you do it right, you can hire a property management company to deal with all the day to day work. So if something goes wrong, if the electricity stops working in this office, I could just call up the property manager and then the property manager will take care of the issue and the landlord won't even hear about it. So I like real estate because of the cash flow that you can get and it can be pretty passive. I'll explain why I say pretty passive in just a second. But the second reason why I like real estate is because of the tax breaks that you get as a real estate investor. Now, although I am a licensed attorney, I'm not your attorney. So if you have specific tax questions, talk to a tax professional in your area. But the IRS rule book gives real estate investors some of the biggest and best tax breaks that our tax code has to offer. I'll show you what I mean. So if I can rent out this home for $1,500 a month, and let's assume for the sake of this example, that my expenses are $1,000 a month to own this property. That's my taxes, my insurance, my maintenance fees, my management fees, and my mortgage is $1,000 a month. This means that every single month, I get to put $500 worth of profit into my pocket. This is the money that I get to put in my pocket, which means every year, I'm putting $6,000 into my pocket. Now, generally, when you make $6,000, you have to pay taxes on $6,000. But because this is real estate, you get a little bit of a tax break. You get to tell the IRS, hey, I made $6,000. This is the money that I put into my pocket. But because my property is one year older, I deserve a tax break. So going back to this home, let's assume that when you bought this home, it was $20,000 for the land and $150,000 for the actual house. Now, you will get to tell the IRS that because this property that I bought is one year older, I deserve a $5,500 tax break, which means you put $6,000 in your pocket. This is the money that's in your bank account, but you only have to pay taxes on $500. This is your taxable income because you get to take this depreciation expense on your property. You calculate this depreciation number based off of how much you paid for the property, but this is a paper depreciation. It's a paper deduction, meaning you take $6,000, put it into your pocket. You can spend all this money, but you only have to pay taxes on 500. This reduces your taxable income and your tax rate because your income is less. This is the first reason why wealthy people love investing their money in real estate.
right? Because you can make a ton of money and pay next to nothing in taxes legally because the tax code says so. And the second reason why wealthy people love investing in real estate for the tax breaks is because, well, let me just show you. So you bought this home for $170,000. You paid $150,000 for the building and $20,000 for the land, a total cost of $170,000. Now let's assume that you own this property for a number of years. Every single year you rent it out and every couple of years you raise the rents, meaning you make bigger profits. And then some time goes by and you look at Zillow and you see, oh, I could sell my property for now $1.7 million. Now this does happen in some instances, most of the time you're not going to see this type of exponential growth in just a few years, but if you're invested in a good area where you see growing demand, where people want to be, you're going to see the prices of your real estate go up. So assuming that this property value goes up from $170,000 to $1.7 million and now you sell it, well now you have a almost $1.5 million gain, which means you got to pay taxes on $1.5 million. Now, even if you have a low tax rate because investors get lower tax rates, that's still a lot of money. But real estate gives you another exception because now what you can do is you can take all of this money, you take the $1.7 million and you go out and you buy a bigger property. Let's assume that now you buy a bigger property with multiple units. I clearly am not a good artist here, but you go out and buy a bigger property with this $1.7 million and this $1.7 million property is going to pay you with more rent, more profit because it's a bigger property and bigger tax breaks for your depreciation deduction. But now the advantage not only is that you own a bigger property, but you don't have to pay any money in taxes today. This is called a 1031 exchange. It's called a like kind exchange. You don't get this in the stock market, but you get this in real estate where you can flip your property after one year. You own the property for a year. You can sell it for a profit, flip it into a bigger property and pay zero dollars in taxes today. And you can do this again and again and again. Keep flipping properties into a bigger and bigger and bigger deal. And you can do this until you die and never have to pay a penny in taxes on these capital gains. This is what wealthy people love doing with their real estate because you can just keep flipping into a bigger property every year or every couple of years, whenever you're ready. You can just keep flipping the property into something bigger and you never have to pay taxes on those gains as long as you do this 1031 like kind of exchange. Now again, make sure you talk to a professional, an attorney, a tax professional in your area that way you're doing this the right way because there's a lot of regulations that are involved with 1031, but this is one of the biggest loopholes for wealthy people because now once the numbers start to get bigger, you just keep adding on zeros and you keep going into the bigger deals and the bigger deals and now your rental income goes up which means you have more cash flow to live off of. The key here for one is this requires you to buy real estate not for you to live in yourself but for you to rent out to somebody else because now this becomes an investment that you're buying for the sole purpose of making money and second you have to understand your market and you have to understand the type of real estate that you want to buy. I like residential real estate because this is a innovation proof real estate we're always going to need a roof over our heads no matter how crazy the metaverse becomes which is why i like residential real estate we've seen retail real estate get hit so hard because of the digital revolution we've seen office real estate get hard because of the pandemic and people working from home those two will keep going through innovative shifts and they're going to be changing a lot but residential real estate we know that people will need a roof over their heads which is why i like single family homes which is why i like apartment complexes the last thing that i want to say regarding real estate is what determines a property that i want to buy because a couple things that i look for beyond just a good area low crime growth in population young people wanting to live there once i have all that the other thing that i want to look for is the numbers and when i say the numbers a lot of times people get confused when they look at real estate because they say oh i can buy this property for $150,000 today and maybe in a few years I'll be able to sell it for $300,000. And if they think like that, they'll be willing to overpay for the property because they have their eyes set on the future price appreciation. All they're looking at is how much can I sell this property for in the future. I don't do that. When I buy real estate, I don't care about what's going to happen to property values tomorrow or next month or next year. The only thing that I care about is how much cash flow I'm going to get. So remember, my goal with real estate is cash flow. I'm working to create income. So when I invest in real estate, I don't care about what's going on with property values. What I'm looking for is a 7% cash on cash return on my money. Meaning for every dollar that I invest, I'm going to make seven cents in positive cash flow, seven cents in profit every single year. If I invest $100,000, 
That's $7,000 a year in positive cash flow. That's what I'm looking for. So when I invest in real estate, remember, you have to understand your goal. My goal is cash flow. Property values crash, okay, I'll go out and buy more. I don't care because this is what I'm looking for. I don't really care about that growth. This is what I'm investing for. And if I do see a lot of growth in real estate prices, well, that's icing on the cake. The second place where you wanna be investing so you don't have to worry about money is in businesses. Now, the reason why I say in businesses is because this goal is to give you growth. With real estate, it was cash flow. Here, when I invest in businesses, I'm looking for growth. And the reason why I say growth in businesses is because you have to look at how do you attract money? The more value that you can provide, the more money that you're gonna make. But when you go out and you buy a home, when you buy an apartment complex, the only way that you can really add more value to raise rents is if you renovate the units and if you make the home nicer. But at the end of the day, if the location isn't good, you're not gonna be able to raise rents significantly. So you're ultimately dependent on the location, which is why real estate is more of a passive way for you to generate that type of cash flow versus in business, you can invest in companies that are working to produce more value. You can invest into a company, that way they can use your cash to hire more employees, to innovate, to create new products, to sell more products, because now the business is actively working to create more value and produce more revenue and make a bigger profit. Now there's a number of different ways that you can invest in business depending on your risk tolerance. So I'm gonna do it in order of least risky to most risky. The least risky would be investing in the stock market. Now you're investing in established companies. Many times these are companies that are worth billions of dollars. Now, of course, you can see a stock go bankrupt. You can see a stock go to zero, but a stock that is on the stock market is less likely to go to zero than a startup that has less than $100 worth of sales. The second, which is a little bit riskier than the stock market, would be investing into what I just said, a startup. A startup now is maybe you're investing into a smaller company, a company that's working on raising their first million or 10 million or $100 million. You can invest some money into the startup, give them some money, that way they have some cash to go out and grow and hopefully get bought out, hopefully go public, that way you can then liquidate your equity and make some more money. This is what you see happen on Shark Tank, where the sharks, the investors, are investing into startup companies and they're hoping to see the startup companies grow. And then you have the option of investing in your own business. Now, I was really debating whether to put this here or this here because when you invest in your own business, you're investing in yourself. And at the end of the day, you are your best investment, which is one of the reasons why it might not be as risky of an investment. But the reason why I put it here is because not everybody's meant to be an entrepreneur. And you don't always know that until you go out and try to start your own business because starting your own business is tough. You have to be very disciplined. You have to be very creative. You have to be able to do the things that a leader and an entrepreneur does, which isn't always very intuitive. So that's why I put it here. But another way that you can invest in business is just investing in yourself and creating your own business. The reason why this is so important is because when you invest in businesses, you get equity. Equity meaning ownership, because that is the way that you build wealth in our economic system. Equity is so important because it allows you to monetize on perceived value instead of just the value that you created. So if you go to work every single day and you make $50,000 a year, you only get $50,000 worth of value. You're only getting $50,000. But if you're a company and you make $50,000 worth of profit, your company might be worth half a million dollars, 10 times the profit, because now the equity, the value of the company is worth a multiple of that profit. So a way for you to now to capitalize on this perceived value, this equity game, is by owning a piece of these companies. Now obviously you can invest in your own company where you work at, or you can go to the stock market and invest in some of these companies. This whole multiple valuation game is so powerful because it allows you to capitalize on this perceived value and allows you to capitalize on the growing values of companies that you believe in. I made a video talking about this not too long ago, but we live in a capitalist society. And in a capitalist society, you can make money one of two ways. You can make money from your labor, which is you going to work every single day, or you can make money from your capital. Make money from your capital is when you invest in equity, 
It says it in the name. In a capitalist society, the way that wealthy people make their money is through their capital more than from their labor. So what you want to do if you're working to become wealthy is you need to use your labor as leverage to use that money that you earn to now go out and invest in equity. That way you can put your capital to work. So you get your capital from your labor. Now you need to put your capital to work by owning equity in the right companies. That way you can get the growth of all the smart people working hard to grow your companies. And there's three ways that you can do that. You can invest in publicly traded stocks, you can invest in startups, or you can invest in your own business. Publicly traded stocks means a company is now on the stock market and anybody can go and buy and sell shares of this company. So if you go and buy one share of Amazon, you become one of the owners of Amazon. If you buy one share of McDonald's, you become one of the owners of McDonald's. Now you don't get to tell the company what to do with that small of ownership, but you get to share in the profits because as these companies make more money and their profits grow, well, the share price goes up. If they don't make as much money and their profits shrink and their companies go bust, well, then the share price of the company that you own will go down as well. So there is risk associated with it. You're never guaranteed to make money, but if you invest in the right companies, then you can make more money. Now, the way that you invest is gonna depend on you. If you like the idea of studying companies and researching companies and reading their financials, then you can go out and invest in individual companies. I like doing that. But if you're not interested in doing all the research and putting in all that time, then you can just invest in some ETFs, an exchange traded fund, which gives you exposure to a basket, a group of companies. I do this as well. So I have a passive strategy where every week I have money that's automatically being invested into a few different ETFs. One ETF is giving me exposure to the S&P 500, which is the biggest 500 companies on the stock market. Uh, some ETFs, they give me exposure to innovation. These are companies that are more along the lines of your technological startup companies that are trying to innovate and create new products. And then I have some ETFs that give me exposure to emerging markets. These are companies and countries that are overseas that are working to grow there. They give me some protection in these ETFs. So in my passive ETF investing system, all I'm trying to do is just invest my money into these ETFs, which give me broader exposure to a bunch of companies instead of me perfect trying to pick the right company. And then in my active strategy, I'm looking for the right company. When I find a good price, that's when I'll come in and buy. That way I can build my equity. But the whole goal here is for me to just accumulate more and more equity over time by consistently putting in more money. With startups, it's a little bit different. Now you're investing in smaller companies that are trying to grow, that are trying to get some sort of market share. That way they could go on to the next stage of their business. The risk here is when you're that small, there's a bigger chance that you will fail. But if you hit the right one, now you can see an insane return on your money because if you can find the next Amazon or the next Uber before it becomes Amazon or Uber, well, now you can see a massive return on your money. So higher risk and higher potential reward. Now there's a bunch of platforms on the internet that let you do this. WeFunder, Republic, and Start Engine are just a few. I've invested some of my own money onto companies on WeFunder. They're not sponsoring me. They're not paying me to say this. I'm just telling you some things that I've done. So I've invested some of my own money into a couple of companies on WeFunder. I've invested into a company called UpCouncil and a couple others. So I like this type of startup investing because I like entrepreneurship and I like taking taking on some of this risk and I like seeing these companies grow, but you gotta know you. If you don't like that added risk, then maybe this isn't for you. And then you have the option to invest in your own business. So earlier this year in 2022, I separated Minority Mindset from the companies and products that we had under Minority Mindset, one of which is Market Briefs. Marketbriefs.com is now its own company and this is our daily financial newsletter. We were running this through Minority Mindset, but the problem was I was having a hard time separating myself, Jaspreet Singh, from Minority Mindset from the products and companies inside of Minority Mindset. That's when I realized that Jaspreet Singh is Minority Mindset and then I separated the companies like Market Briefs from Minority Mindset. So now Market Briefs is its own company and I'm investing my own money that I make from Minority Mindset and other places into Market Briefs. That way I can grow Market Briefs and our team bigger, faster because I believe and I know that our Market Briefs newsletter is the best financial newsletter out there and I'm working to grow this every single day along with our whole Market Briefs team. But before you go out and just blindly throw your money into your business, you have to first understand the risks and the work that it takes to become an entrepreneur. I know there's been this whole movement of working just a few hours a week with a laptop lifestyle. If you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't really work like that. Entrepreneurship is hard. You're going to work a lot of hours. You're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices and you're, you're going to have to put in a lot of time. 
And if you're not willing to do that, then I do not recommend you go out and start your own business. Now, going back to the goal, the goal here by investing in these types of companies is so you can see more growth in the companies that you're investing in. You wanna invest a thousand dollars, that way you can see your $1,000 grow to something a whole lot bigger. Then you can take this new money that you have and you can either live off of this money or you can take this money, put it into real estate and create more income off of this growth that you created from your stocks. That's the way that I look at this. I don't really like investing in stocks for dividends, especially right now, because if a company is paying out a dividend, what that means is that this company is taking out their profits and they don't have a better place to use this money. They're not gonna use this money to go out and buy another company. They don't have a place to take this money and invest it back into their company to grow faster because they're already pretty large. So instead, they take their big profits and they just give it away to shareholders. Now, it's good for shareholders because you get regular checks in the mail, but then that also means that you're gonna see slower growth because this company has a bunch of money and they don't have anywhere to put it. So if that's something you're interested in, then you can consider investing in dividend paying companies, but I rather see my cash flow through real estate, which is why I like real estate income, real estate cash flow more than I like dividend cash flow, and I like the idea of investing in businesses, that way I can see the growth through building more equity in these companies. Third, you wanna invest some of your money in into real money. And the reason why I say real money is because you wanna have a protectionary investment. That way, if the American dollar begins to collapse, if the American economy really starts to go down and real estate prices now aren't worth as much and businesses aren't worth as much, you wanna have something to fall back on. This is why I own some physical gold. Gold is your traditional inflationary hedge because gold has been used as real money for centuries and everybody, whether you're in India, China, Mexico, United States, everybody knows the value of physical gold. So I own some physical gold for that reason. And the new thing that you're seeing a lot of young people move towards is Bitcoin. Now, I own Bitcoin as well and I buy Bitcoin on a daily dollar cost average system, but Bitcoin doesn't provide you the same security that gold does. Sure, Bitcoin might be the next digital gold. Bitcoin has a lot of potential in the future, but it is not exactly there yet. It's not there yet in the sense of protection. It's not there yet in the sense of security. However, it might be there in the future, but because Bitcoin is just so volatile, you see so many crashes and swings up and down. I wouldn't say that it is your real money, the way that gold is. Now, I am believe in Bitcoin. I think there's a lot of potential behind Bitcoin, which is why I buy Bitcoin every single day, but I also own physical gold as another way for me to save money. I look at gold like real money. I don't really care about what's going on with the price of gold. I just look at it as a way for me to save some hard money because I understand that physical gold is real money. And if the worst were to happen and I need to pick up and go somewhere else in the world, well, I could take my gold with me and I know that I could convert my gold for another sort of currency or money or whatever I needed to do. So this is my protectionary I know that gold will provide me with that. Bitcoin will hopefully do the same thing, which is why I'm buying Bitcoin. But this is, if the world starts to end, doomsday scenario, this is my protectionary investment for that. And Bitcoin is kind of that, but it also is a way for me to invest in the new age technology. It's a way for me to invest in the blockchain because I think there's a lot of value in Bitcoin. But again, very volatile, very speculative. There's a lot more to being financially successful than just making money. You gotta know what to do with the money you make. That's why there's so many six-figure earners that are living broke. You gotta know how to spend your money the right way. And in this video, I'm gonna be going over 10 places where your money needs to go. When most people talk about where your money needs to go, they give you a flow chart of what you need to do with your paycheck. So they say, okay, you just got paid from your job. Now some of your money needs to go into your 401k. Now whatever's left is gonna go into your checking account and out of your checking account, some of this money is going to be invested. Some of this money is going to be be saved and some of this money is going to be left over for you to spend. I've already talked about what you need to do with your paycheck as soon as you get paid. So if you want to learn more about this, I will link that video for you in the description below. But in this video, I want to go a little bit deeper and talk about where your money needs to go to develop you and your finances. There's a lot more to life than money, okay? Now, this doesn't mean that money isn't important or that money doesn't matter. Anybody who tells you that money is important or money doesn't matter is either broke or delusional because it costs money to eat and it costs money to feed other people. But you need to know how money plays a part in your life. This is my QuadraFit Theory. If you're subscribed to our YouTube channel, you've heard me talk about this before. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, you should probably do that. 
but this kind of lays out the four different aspects of our lives. You have the physical aspect, the mental aspect, the spiritual aspect, and then finally, the financial aspect. If you want to live a happy life, you need to be fit in all four of these things. You got to be healthy in all four of these areas if you want to be able to live a good life and you want to start by being physically fit. Now, when I say physically fit, I don't mean that you have to have a six pack. I mean, you got to be physically healthy. If you are morbidly obese or you're on your deathbed, it doesn't matter how much money you make. You got to be physically healthy enough first to be able to live your life. Then you got to be mentally healthy. If you are struggling with depression or anxiety or you're not happy or you don't have people that you love around you, it is very hard to be happy. And if you're not happy, it doesn't matter how much money you make. More money is just going to make you more miserable. After that, you got to be spiritually fit. When I say spiritually fit, that doesn't necessarily mean religion. That means having a purpose in life. Why are you on this earth? What are you getting up to do every single day? You need to have a purpose for why you need to get out of bed every single day. Then once you're physically fit, mentally fit, spiritually fit, this is where being financially fit comes in handy because now you have money to amplify your life and this is where you got to know how to spend your money and you need to know where your money needs to go. Then at the tippy tippy top, do you see that right there? The last thing you got to do is smash that thumbs up button below. That last part's optional. So when you have money, there's 10 places that your money needs to go and these are in no particular order. First, some of your money needs to keep going back into your mind and developing yourself. Growing up, I was never a fan of reading. English is my second language and I struggled in English class and so I never liked reading books. The first books that I ever read cover to cover were business books, but even that was kind of hard for me because I've always been a slow reader. That's when I found out about audiobooks, but this is before Audible was a thing, so I used to listen to audiobooks on CD and I still have a copy of some of mine. This one is The 7 Habits of Highly Effective People. I still got this one in my office. Most of us don't grow up with parents who are multi-millionaires that just teach us how to become wealthy. And so if you don't know anybody who's wealthy or an investor in your circle, what you can do is break out of your circle by reading books, by learning from people who are actually doing it. I used to buy almost every personal development or business or investing audio CD that I could get my hands on and I listened to it while I was driving and when I finished it, I would just throw it in my back seat and so the back seat of my car used to just be filled with audio CDs. Now it's a lot easier because you can just download Audible and have all your audio books on your phone. The interesting thing for me about reading books is when you read more books, you become smarter and the smarter you become the more you realize that you don't know anything. But I also know that I don't know everything, which is why I keep learning and reading more books and taking more classes. There's a quote that really stuck with me on this, and it said that the moment you stop learning is the moment you start dying, which is why you want to keep investing in your mind. Second, spend money on your health. I think it was Warren Buffett who originally said this, but imagine for a second that the day you turned 16, you got your license and you were given a car, but then you were told that this is the only car you'll ever be able to drive in your life. So no matter what you do, you'll never be able to get a new car, what would you do? Well, chances are you're going to take really good care of this car. You're going to get your oil changes, you're going to do the maintenance, you're going to keep it clean, and you're going to make sure it keeps driving well because if it doesn't drive, then you're not going to ever have a car again. Now, same story again, but this time imagine that you replace the car with your body. You're only given one body, so take care of it. I work a lot, but I am not scared to invest money or time into my physical health. I try to go on a five mile walk every morning and go to the gym. At the very least, invest in a gym membership or some equipment so you can work out or exercise every single day. Get yourself some healthy food. Pay a little bit extra if you have to, to eat healthy. Don't just eat McDonald's all day every day because this is the only machine that you ever get. I know this is a little bit ironic because Warren Buffett who gave that original speech loves eating McDonald's and drinking Coke, but he's an exception to the rule. Make your doctor's appointments, be proactive with your health, and if you don't feel mentally healthy, if you're depressed or you're anxious or you don't feel happy, get that taken care of. Go get a therapist, invest in it, whatever it takes because if you are not mentally healthy, it doesn't matter what you're doing externally because you're not going to be able to live up here. Third, on the financial side of things, invest some money into paper assets. This is what most people think about when they think about investing. You're investing your money in stocks or bonds or your 401k or your IRA. All a paper asset means is you're investing in something on paper. You're not getting anything really tangible. So if you go out and you invest in one share of the McDonald's company, you become one of the owners of McDonald's on paper, but you don't get to own a physical franchise. You don't own a building. You you don't own any burgers, you own just a piece of the McDonald's company and so you own their stock on paper. The advantage of this is it is very accessible. If you want to invest in the stock market, whether it's through your 401k or your IRA or your own personal account, it's not that hard to do. All you got to do is open up an account 
and fund it, and then you can put your money into whatever funds or stocks that you want. Our economy is made up of companies that sell products. This is where you can come in and you can own a piece of some of the biggest companies in our economy by buying some of their stocks on the stock market. If you buy one share of the McDonald's company, you become one of the owners of McDonald's. If you buy one share of Amazon, you become one of the owners of Amazon. You're not going to get to tell Amazon or McDonald's how to run their business, but you get to share in the profits when they make money. If you believe in the future of the economy, that means you think that companies are going to grow and make more money in the future. If companies make more money in the future, that means their stocks, the things that you can buy right now, are going to be more valuable in the future. So you can take your money today and put this into the stock market, into things like paper assets, and now you're buying an asset that if it continues to grow, it will make you more money. This is what financially wealthy people do. They make money, and then before they spend all their money on clothes and cars and things that don't make them any money, they buy assets like stocks because now their money is going to work and it's working to make them more money. Fourth, your money needs to buy you some tangible assets too. I love real estate investing because you get tax benefits and you get passive income, but the difference between real estate investing and stock market investing is when you invest in real estate, you're buying something tangible, something you can see, feel, and touch. When you buy one share of McDonald's, you don't get anything tangible. You're just getting a paper asset. If you invest your money in McDonald's and then their executives run the company into the ground and your stock goes bankrupt, well, you have nothing to show for it because now all your money is gone. If you buy a property, you buy a house, and then your tenant leaves and they destroy the property, you still have a property to show for it. You still own the home. But tangible assets like real estate and gold also have the downfalls. Investing in real estate takes way more work and it takes way more money. I mean, if you want to go and invest in the stock market, you can do that for less than $100. If you want to go out and buy a home, it's going to cost you way more than that. I mean, yeah, you can go out and get a loan from the bank, but you still got to have more money in order to buy properties. And real estate has a way bigger learning curve in order for you to get started. I mean, if you just want to invest in the stock market, you can invest in a fund, an index fund that gives you exposure to the entire stock market. And now you don't have to do any research. You just throw your money in the fund and that's it. If you want to buy real estate, you got to learn to deal with real estate agents and contractors and real estate accountants and real estate attorneys. Plus with real estate, you are the CEO of your money and it's your job to make sure your money makes you money. When you invest your money in McDonald's, you got the McDonald's CEO working to make you money. With gold, assuming you're buying physical gold bars, now you have something tangible. I mean, you can see, feel, and touch that gold, but you need a place to store it, which costs money. And that gold is not going to make you any money unless you sell it. And gold isn't producing any more value. When you invest invest your money in gold, it just sits there and looks back at you. It's not like buying a home where you can rent it out to a tenant who's going to pay you every single month. And it's not like investing your money in McDonald's or Amazon where you have a whole team of people working to make you more money. But you do want to balance out your paper assets by owning tangible assets because if you see a paper asset crash, like if you see stock market values come down drastically, you want to have some tangible physical assets that you can fall back on. Fifth, your money needs to buy you some financial insurance. When I say that your money needs to buy you financial insurance, I'm not saying that you just need to go out and buy life insurance, although life insurance is very important. I'll link an article for you in the description below that explains why. What I mean is you need to have some financial protection to protect you and your family against anything. This starts by having a savings cushion. Make sure you have some money in the bank to protect you just in case you lose your job or in case an emergency happens. That way you have money to fall back on. Get yourself a will or some other sort of estate planning because you don't want your family fighting each other over who gets your money when you die. You definitely want to do this sooner rather than later because, well, well, we can't predict when we're gonna go. There's a couple ways that you can go about doing this. If you don't have a ton of money, then you can just go online and create a will for like two or 300 bucks. If you have more money or more assets and you wanna make sure that things are done right, then call up an estate planning attorney in your area and have them work with you to create a full plan. That way you know how your assets are gonna be distributed after you die. And financial insurance also means having insurance. Big surprise there, right? Look, I don't like paying for insurance, but it's a small price I pay today to protect me against a big headache in the future. If you have a business, you need business insurance and probably multiple kinds of business insurance depending on how big you are. You need health insurance, car insurance, home insurance, and you might need life insurance too. Again, I have an article below that explains why. Sixth, your money needs to buy you your needs. See what I did there? There's a difference between what you need and what you want. I'm gonna get to your wants in just a second, but you gotta not confuse your wants for your needs. You need a place to stay, but if you don't have any money, do you need to be spending $1,500 
a month on rent. When I was in law school, I wanted to invest as much as I could back into me and my business and my investments. So I shared an apartment where I slept on the living room floor. I didn't have a room. And so every night when I came home, I would pull my mattress out, put it into the living room floor, put it on the ground, put on my sheets, go to sleep, wake up the next morning, pack up my sheets, put my mattress back in the hallway, and then go on with my day. That's how I had a place to stay for less than $400 a month, including my internet, including my heat, including my electricity, including my water, and including my parking. You need a car to get to work, but do you need to pay $800 a month for a Benz? Uh, no. Before you spend money on what you want, you gotta spend money on what you need and take care of yourself, your physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health, and your financial health by investing your money and building a savings cushion before you go out and buy all the things you want. And this brings me to number seven, spending money on things you want. Anybody can be financially successful if you have discipline and delayed gratification. Delayed gratification means I wanna go on a $10,000 trip to Hawaii, but I don't got $10,000 to do that, so I'm not gonna put this on my credit card and I'm gonna wait to save up more money until I got $10,000 to go on this vacation. The thing you have to understand here with your wants is anytime you spend money on something you want, so a Benz or a trip to Hawaii, that's money that you cannot use to build your wealth. But the whole point of being financially smart is so you can spend your money on things that you want. So it's a balance. You don't wanna spend all your money on wants before you can afford it because you're just gonna rack up a whole bunch of debt and not have any assets. And you also don't wanna have this delayed gratification for your whole life and never be able to enjoy your life. The simplest thing that you can do is create a financial system for your money like the 75, 15, 10 rule that we have. What this says is anytime you make a dollar, 75 cents is the maximum you can spend 15 cents is the minimum you invest, and 10 cents is the minimum you save. So when you follow this plan, you know what money you have to spend, and now when you have the spending money and you wanna buy something you want, follow a rule of five, which says if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. Also, when it comes to your wants, don't finance anything that doesn't pay you because now you're paying interest on something that's losing money. Eight, use your money to buy your time back. When you have money, you can buy a better car, you can buy a better vacation, you can buy a better food, you can buy a better gym membership, but the one thing that your money cannot buy you is more time. Every single one of us get 24 hours a day, that's it. And none of us know when our last day is gonna be, which is why you wanna use some of your money to buy your time back. If you work long hours Monday through Friday and all of your evenings are spent cooking dinner and planning for the next day and all of your weekends are spent doing home chores, it doesn't matter how much money you make, you have no time. If you don't like cooking or you don't like doing home chores, then use some of your money to hire somebody to do some of these things for you. That way you can buy your time back. You can save time on weekdays by doing a grocery or a meal delivery service or maybe even hire a chef depending on how much money you're making. And you can hire somebody to help you with your home chores. That way you don't have to spend all of your time doing that. Now you're effectively buying your time back because now you have more time to do the things that you wanna do. We can even put a dollar figure on this. If you value your time at $25 an hour and you can hire somebody to cook for you or clean for you or do your chores for you at $14 an hour, it is profitable for you to hire somebody else to do the things that you don't wanna do, that way you have more time. And what are you gonna do with this newfound time? Well, you can invest money in nine, doing things you like. You should want to live a fulfilling life and that means doing things that you like to do. If you have a hobby, spend money on that, try something new, try an acting class, try a dance class, try a pottery class, Try new things, see what you like. If you have a spouse or a partner or a family that takes care of you, spend some of your money taking care of them. Again, the key here is to do this when you can afford to do it. These are not things that are gonna give you an immediate ROI on your money, but these are things that you can spend your money on because now you have money. And number 10, use some of your money to give back. It costs money to eat and it costs money to feed other people. When you have money, you can take better care of yourself and you can take better care of your community. We've all been in tough situations before and sometimes we just need a little push. And when you're in a position where you can help somebody, either you have knowledge or you have financial resources, or if you have something else, connections, you can use these things to help other people. The more you have, the more you can do. We all have things that we're passionate about, and when you have money, you can use your money to make a difference. Mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs are three ways that you can invest your money in the stock market, but they can come with very different investment results. When I invest my money, there's two things that I always look for. I look at how much risk is involved, and I look at how much money I can potentially make. If I was gonna invest $10,000, and I had to decide between investing this $10,000 into my broke cousin Bunty, who's on his 34th business idea or investing this money into Amazon who's established and has a business plan and is very successful, I'm gonna expect very different returns to justify my investment. Bunty is a risky investment, so I'm gonna need bigger potential returns to justify me giving him my cash because as soon as I give him the $10,000, there's a good chance that he's gonna invest that money into a new Gucci wardrobe. 
I gotta look good for the business. Deciding between investing your money in my cousin Bunty or Amazon is pretty obvious. I'm gonna invest my money in Bunty. But what if you had to decide between investing your money between Amazon and Apple and FedEx and Verizon and McDonald's and Microsoft? Who's gonna give you the best return for your risk now? Not so easy anymore. There's three different ways that you can take this. Option one is you can spend all the time researching these companies and you might decide that Apple is the best company to invest in based off of all your research and now you invest all your money into Apple. This one has the most risk because now if Apple releases a really bad iPhone and people start hating Apple products and their company tanks, well, down with it goes your money. It also comes with the most upside because now if you're right and Amazon wins big, then you're gonna win big. Option two is now you can open up a stock brokerage and instead of just investing in one company like Apple, you can invest in every one of these companies. That way you're lowering your risk. If you do wanna learn more about how to actually open up a stock brokerage and invest your money in stocks, our team wrote an article on our website, theminoritymindset.com, that walks you through how to do that. So if you wanna read that article, I'll link it for you in the description below. This one requires more work because now you're not just managing and monitoring one stock, you got to manage and monitor a whole portfolio of your stocks. Or option three is you can pay a small fee and then you can invest in a fund like a mutual fund or an index fund or an ETF and let these funds invest in all these companies for you. So now instead of you going out and investing in all these companies, you invest in a fund that gives you exposure to all these companies. Well, all three of these funds give you exposure to the stock market. They work in very different ways, which can affect how much money you make, which is why you want to understand the differences. And that's what I'm going to be going over in this video as soon as you fund that thumbs up button below. Let's start with mutual funds. Mutual funds are known as actively managed funds. And to understand how they work, let's assume for the sake of this example that this is a mutual fund that's made up of only four stocks. A lot of times mutual funds will have way more stocks, sometimes hundreds of stocks. But just to keep things simple, we're going to assume that this mutual fund only has four stocks. If you wanted to invest in McDonald's, Tesla, Apple, and Amazon, one thing that you could do is you could go out, open a stock brokerage, and individually invest in McDonald's, Tesla, Apple, and Amazon. But now you have to decide how much of your money are you going to allocate towards each stock and what stocks do you want to own. On the flip side, when you invest in a mutual fund, you have this person right here, we're gonna call this person a money manager, and we're gonna draw him a nice mustache. This money manager is who you're trusting. So you're gonna give your money to this money manager, and this money manager is gonna create this fund. So this person is managing this fund, and when this money manager likes a stock, they're gonna buy it. When they don't like a stock, they will sell it. So maybe right now this money manager likes these four stocks, but some time goes by and he's like, you know what, I don't like McDonald's anymore, we're gonna replace them with Chipotle. So now he's monitoring the stocks, and he He's actively buying and selling based off of what he thinks is going on in the market and based off of what he thinks is going to make this fund more money. The whole point of a mutual fund is to have a really smart money manager with the goal of this money manager being able to beat the general stock market. So you are hoping that by paying this money manager a fee, you are going to be able to outperform the stock market, which in turn will make you more money. You're also getting the benefit of passiveness because now you're not having to go out and individually invest in all of these companies and manage each one of these companies you have a money manager who's going to do that and you also have the benefit of diversity because now this money manager is diversifying your money into different companies if you want to invest your money into a mutual fund like this you can expect this to cost you something like two percent a year on all of your assets what that means is if you deposit a hundred dollars into your mutual fund this money manager is going to take two dollars a year to manage your hundred dollars so if you invest a thousand dollars that's twenty dollars in fees and if you invest a hundred thousand dollars that's two thousand dollars a year in fees now while two percent might not sound like a lot of money it does add up especially as your money grows and compounds like if you started investing five hundred dollars a month today and you were paying two percent a year in fees and you were able to get an average seven percent return on your money over the next 30 years you're gonna end up paying something like $166,000 in fees to your money manager just to invest your money. Now look, I'm a value person. If you can make me an extra $1,000, I will gladly pay you an extra 2% in fees. So if you can make me more money, I will pay you more money as long as I continue to come on top. The only issue with this is what we've seen over the long term is these mutual funds don't always outperform the market. Actually, a lot of mutual funds can't even meet the returns of the general stock market over the long term. Like Warren Buffett was so confident in this that he made a $1 million bet that the general stock market, the S&P 500, would be able to outperform a number of hedge funds. These are highly sophisticated, highly expensive hedge funds. And over a course of 10 years, the hedge funds did well, 
but they did not even meet the stock market returns. So then the hedge fund owner had to then pay Warren Buffett a million dollars because he lost the bet and Warren Buffett took that million dollars and he donated it to charity. I'm gonna go over how you can get the general returns of the stock market without paying these high fees, but in general, a mutual fund's goal is to be able to beat the market. That's why you're paying these fees to a money manager, that way you have somebody who can hopefully beat the market. The only problem with that is a lot of times you will not beat the market. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. It's really hard to predict because it's hard to beat the market, especially over the long term. This is not to say that mutual funds are never the right answer. I mean, there are some really good mutual funds out there, but a lot of these really good mutual funds are reserved for super high net worth people. Like you need at least half a million dollars to get into some of these mutual funds versus some of the regular mutual funds that you're just paying 2% on. You could get a better return without paying all the fees. Second, let's talk about index funds. So the whole idea of index funds came about by this company called Vanguard. And Vanguard said, you know, what if we could let people invest in a group of funds like this without paying these super high fees? Well, the only issue with that is you need to pay this money to a money manager. So if Vanguard wanted to create this index fund where you can invest in a fund without paying all these fees, they also had to get rid of this person with a mustache right here. And instead what they did was they replaced that person with a mustache with a computer who automates this investments. Now you're investing in a fund, a group of companies, but instead of having a money manager decide which companies are in this fund, you're gonna have a computer decide. So you create an algorithm. What are the type of companies you want to invest in? You punch that into the computer and then the computer decides what company fits that fund. For example, I just talked about investing in a fund that gives you exposure to the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is an index, meaning it's a group of stocks that gives you exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market. Now, one thing you can do is go out and individually invest in all 500 of these companies, but that's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of management headache. Or you can invest in an index fund that gives you exposure to all 500 of these companies. That's what Vanguard allowed you to do. Now you can just invest in this index fund and that gives you exposure to these top 500 companies. So now you're getting exposure to the general stock market without paying all the fees. VFIAX is the Vanguard index fund that gives you exposure to the general stock market. So Vanguard is the company that created this index fund. There's a bunch of banks and a bunch of companies that create these type of things. Vanguard is just one of those companies who's the first to create index fund. So Vanguard has this index fund, which is a group of stocks that gives you exposure to the top 500 companies. If you wanna know how much fees these index funds cost, all you gotta do is search it on Google. So like with this VFIAX, you can see it says in the title that this is the Vanguard 500 Index Fund Admiral Shares. It has the word index fund in the title, so you know it's an index fund. And over here, you can see something called the expense ratio. This expense ratio is how much money you're gonna be paying in fees. That's what you wanna pay attention to. 0.04% in fees means that for every $100 you invest, you're gonna be paying four pennies in fees. Compare that to the 2% fee you'd have to pay with a mutual fund where you're paying $2 out of every $100 you invest. So the fees with an index fund are way less because now you substituted that money manager with a computer and computers are a lot cheaper to maintain than people especially if they have a mustache. What you have to understand about index funds is a lot of them have a minimum investment. Like this Vanguard index fund has a minimum investment of $3,000. So if you don't have $3,000 to invest, you cannot invest in this index fund. And you also can't just buy and sell this index fund whenever you like. Index funds like VFIAX only let you buy and sell this index once a day. So if you're trying to trade index funds and mutual funds, that's not the way to go because you can't just buy and sell an index fund whenever you want. You can only do that one time in the day and typically it happens at 4 p.m. as soon as the market closes. But if you're looking to be a long-term investor, it really shouldn't matter too much because now you're looking to invest for the long-term, you're not looking to invest for two hours. And so what happens now is you're not gonna see people trading these index funds every single day because you just can't do that. The alternative to investing in an index fund like this is investing into an ETF. ETF, which stands for an exchange traded fund, because ETFs that you buy and sell these funds kind of like stocks. You can buy and sell these ETFs whenever you want. And some index funds have ETF versions of them too. Like if we go back to the Vanguard website, you'll see that this index fund also has an ETF version. It says it right below the title also available in an ETF. If you click that button, it will take you to the ETF version of this index fund, which is VOO. VOO is an ETF that gives you exposure to the S&P 500, so the top 500 companies in the stock market, and this has an expense ratio of 0.03%. You can find this the same way you find the expense ratio of an index fund, just search it on Google, and on its website, it will tell you what its expense ratio is. That's how much money you have to pay in fees every single year. So here, if you invest $100, you're gonna be paying three cents a year in fees, so almost nothing. 
nothing. But unlike an index fund, you can buy and sell shares of VOO every single day whenever you want when the market is open. Remember with the Vanguard index fund, you had a $3,000 minimum investment and those transactions only happen once a day. With VOO, you don't have a minimum investment. All you have to do is buy one share of this ticker symbol and then you can buy or sell VOO whenever you want throughout the day. So between this Vanguard ETF that gives the exposure to the S&P 500 and the Vanguard index fund that gives the exposure to the S&P 500, they both charge you essentially the same fees. They both invest in the same companies. The difference is VOO, you can see the real-time price throughout the day versus the index fund you cannot. VOO does not have a minimum amount of money you have to invest versus the index fund you do. However, the index fund allows you to automatically invest or withdraw your money versus this ETF does not. So if you invest your money through Vanguard, you can automatically reinvest more money every single month through Vanguard versus with this ETF, you cannot do that. So if you're looking for a passive way to invest your money, the index fund gives you the benefit because now your money can automatically be invested every single month without you having to do anything versus you can't do that with an ETF unless you're using a brokerage that can passively invest your money for you. The whole reason for you to invest your money into these passive investments is to see your money passively grow and compound over time. But if you want to see your money really compound quickly, you got to keep adding money to your investments. And the simplest way to do that is every single month, just add more money into this fund. So if you invest your money into the index fund, that can automatically happen. You can't do that with this unless you use a brokerage that automatically pulls money out of your savings account or your checking account and they invest this money into your fund. If you want to learn more about how to do that, our team put together an article that breaks down the basics of investing and I'll link it for you in the description below. So ETFs work almost the exact same way that stocks do because you can buy or sell shares of an ETF the same way you do a stock. You can see the real-time price of an ETF the same way you can do a stock and you don't have a minimum investment you have to invest minus the share price the same way you do a stock. Index funds on the other hand can give you exposure to all the same companies and they let you do the automatic investing too. When it comes to your money actually being invested in an ETF or an index fund, there's an algorithm that tells the computer which company should be in your fund. So if you're investing in this ETF or in this index fund that gives you exposure to the top 500 companies, now what this algorithm is gonna look at is which companies are in the S&P 500. If one of the companies in here, so let's assume Tesla for the sake of this example, tanks and Tesla stops making money and the market cap decreases, then what this index fund will do is say, okay, Tesla is no longer in the S&P 500. They're no longer one of the top 500 companies or the biggest 500 companies. So they're going to kick Tesla out and they're gonna put in whatever the new company is that replaces Tesla. So it happens passively. You don't have to do anything. This happens in your index fund for you. And because this is happening through an algorithm, through a computer, you get to pay way less fees. So between mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs, which one can make you the most money? Well, before I say that, let me just remind you that investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. You might even lose money. So make sure you always do your own due diligence and never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. In general, for the majority of people, I mean, there's always gonna be outliers and exceptions to the rule, but for the majority of people in general, Index funds and ETFs are gonna be the better way to go because now you're going to meet the stock market returns and you don't have to pay the super high fees. Now, obviously there are some mutual funds that are gonna do great. There are some mutual funds that are gonna greatly outperform the market, but there's a chance that you might not get that mutual fund. There's a chance you're gonna pay the high mutual fund fees without even getting the market returns. So if you believe in the American economy, then you're gonna believe in the American stock market, which means over the long run, the stock market will continue to go up. And if that's the case, then you can just get the consistent returns of the stock market by investing your money in the general stock market, by investing in an ETF or an index fund that gives you exposure to the general stock market. Between an ETF and an index fund, this is really personal preference. I mean, do you wanna have the automatic reinvestment into an index fund or do you wanna just invest your money into a brokerage that can automatically invest your money for you. Personally, I like ETFs because I like the freedom that comes with them. The key to succeeding with any of these is really just consistently investing your money month after month after month and keeping your money in the market for long enough. History has showed us that the stock market and the economy always goes up. That doesn't mean it'll always go straight up. Sometimes it will come down, sometimes it will crash, and sometimes it will correct. But over the long run, it will continue to go up as long as the economy keeps growing. So if you believe in the American economy, then this is a way for you to get that upside without actually starting your own company. If you've been looking for specific places to invest your money to build your wealth, well, look no further because in this video, I'm gonna be going over some of the best ETFs to invest in to make some money. Investing in the stock market isn't always easy. I mean, the stock market is the most accessible place for somebody to go and invest their money to build wealth, but at the same time, 
So many people lose their money in the stock market because they either don't know how to invest their money in stocks, they don't know how to research stocks, or they get emotional, they buy a stock, they see it go down a little bit, and then they sell at a loss. And then a few weeks later, the stock pops back up. I knew I shouldn't have sold. If you don't want to spend all of your time researching stocks and picking stocks and keeping up with stocks, then another thing that you can do instead of just trying to invest in individual stocks is invest in something called an ETF or an exchange traded fund. An ETF, you can kind of think of it like a basket of stocks, a group of stocks. Now what you're doing is instead of trying to find the perfect companies to invest in, you're investing in a group of stocks, which gives you exposure to a whole bunch of stocks. Now, if one of the companies in your ETF goes bankrupt, well, you're okay because your ETF will have hundreds of other companies to make up for that loss. So even if one company goes bankrupt, it's not a big deal. But if you invest in one company and this one company that you invest in goes bankrupt, now your entire investment is gone. The nice thing about ETFs is it makes investing a lot more passive for you because now you don't have to keep up with every individual company. You just find the right ETF, you throw your money in there, and you keep investing your money every week or every month. And now you're just consistently building up this portfolio of this ETF or ETFs that you like. And this ETF is doing all the work to invest your your money for you. Plus, ETFs work just like stocks. You can start investing in ETFs with as little as $100 and you can buy or sell your ETF whenever you want. But the whole idea about investing your money in ETFs, just so you know, is you want to be investing for the long term. So we're talking years now where you want to buy something and you want to just keep investing in it and hold it for the long term. That way you allow the market to grow and your companies to grow to make you more money. Now, the thing that makes ETFs really interesting is you have different types of ETFs that give you exposure to different types of stocks. And in this video, I'm going to be going over seven different types of ETFs with different ETFs within each type that we can understand some of the best ways that you can go out and start investing your money and building wealth. So let's jump into these seven types of ETFs. But before I do that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash the thumbs up button below. And just so you know, if you are interested in learning more about how you can start investing in the stock market and start building wealth in the stock market, our team has put together an amazing guide on how to invest your money in the stock market. This guide will walk you through different stock markets strategies and how to invest your money in the stock market and build wealth in the stock market. This guide is completely free when you sign up for our daily newsletter. So if you want to read our free stock market investing guide, I'll put the link to how you can download this guide in the description below. The first and probably the most popular group of ETFs are the ones that give you exposure to the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 is just the largest 500 companies in the United States that trade on the stock market. So if you are a company and you are one of the biggest 500 companies on the stock market, well then you are gonna fall into the S&P 500. So this is literally just an index or a group of the biggest 500 companies on the stock market. A couple ETFs that will give you exposure to the S&P 500 are VOO and SPY. Small disclaimer, I do own shares of VOO. Now what you need to understand about this is when you go out and you buy shares of VOO or SPY on the stock market, this is now an ETF. So when you buy either one of these, you're getting exposure to the 500 largest companies on the stock market. Now you don't have to go out and individually buy each company. These ETFs are out buying these 500 largest companies and they're managing that investment for you. So all you have to do is invest your money into here or here, and now you have exposure to the 500 largest companies on the stock market. Now, before I go any further, I gotta make sure this is clear. Investing money has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. You might even lose money. So always do your own due diligence and never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. Everything that I'm talking about today are just examples. I'm not telling you what to invest in and I'm not telling you where you need to invest. I'm giving you examples of how these ETFs work and a couple ETF examples that way you understand where to look. But I want you to do your own research because there are a ton of ETFs out there. So you gotta find what's right for you. So the thing that differentiates these two ETFs is one who manages the ETFs and then what this ETF actually invests in and how much. So this is a Vanguard ETF and this is a Spider ETF. What that means is Vanguard, the company, is the one that owns and manages this ETF and Spider is the one that manages this. By the way, just so you know, Spider is spelled S P D. Are. Now, when we talk about what companies an ETF is invested in, you want to look a little bit deeper than just the companies, because what's going to happen is both of these ETFs are both going to be invested in the biggest 500 companies in the stock market, but one might be invested more in Microsoft than Apple, the other might be more invested in Tesla, and so they both give you exposure to the top 500 companies, and this is where you can do a little bit of research and see how much each ETF is invested into what. One of the easiest ways to do that is just to go to finance.yahoo.com, and then you can just enter in these two tickets 
ticker symbols. And then you'll see, if you scroll down, you'll see some of the top companies that each of these ETFs are invested in. Or you can go onto the Vanguard website or the Spider website, and they'll show you which companies these ETFs are invested in and how much. That way you can get an idea of which companies you're getting exposure to. Another thing that you can pay attention to when you're comparing different ETFs is the expense ratio. The expense ratio, if you go to finance.yahoo.com, you'll see it there. You'll also see it on both of these websites. This is how much money you are paying to have your money managed by this ETF. So the advantage with an ETF, especially a low cost ETF, is you're gonna pay way less money to have your money managed here than to have somebody physically managing your money with an actively managed portfolio. So these type of ETFs, these are passively managed meaning they're managed by a computer. So all these ETFs are doing is they're giving exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market. If one of the companies in these top 500 companies goes bankrupt and gets smaller, well then this ETF or this computer is just gonna kick out that company and it's gonna put in the next biggest company. That way your money is still being managed by the computer, but it's like an algorithm. It's gonna give you exposure to the 500 biggest companies. The expense ratio on both of these ETFs are very low. It's less than 0.1%, which means if you invest 10,000 dollars into one of these ETFs, they're going to charge you less than $10 a year to manage your money. But that expense ratio is definitely something you want to remember as you start comparing more and more ETFs. And as we go deeper in this video, because you're going to learn about different types of ETFs. And so if you're trying to compare different types of ETFs and see what's better for you, the expense ratio is something you should be paying attention to. The second type of ETF that you might want to consider is a total stock market ETF, kind of like V. T-I. So a total stock market ETF gives the exposure to the entire stock market. Previously, we talked about the S&P 500 index, which gives the exposure to the 500 biggest companies in the stock market. Something like VTI will give you exposure to the entire stock market with big companies, medium-sized companies, and small-sized companies. So now you're literally just investing your money in the stock market. And if the stock market goes up, your ETF should go up the stock market goes down, the ETF in general should go down. So now you're essentially giving yourself exposure to the entire broad market. This is another Vanguard ETF. And the thing you got to understand about this is if you don't know what sector to invest in or what industry to invest in or kind of a more generalized place to invest, then this might be a good place for you to invest because now you're just investing your money in the stock market and you're hoping that the stock market will go up. So if you believe in the United States economy, then you should be believing in the United States stock market, which means that in the long term, the United States stock market should go up. And if it does go up, well, then this ETF will give you exposure to that. The third type of ETF that you want to consider are high dividend yielding ETFs. So there's two ways that you can make money in the stock market. You can make money through appreciation, which is when you invest your money in a stock, you buy it for $100 a share, and then the price of the stock goes up to $200 a share, and then you sell. You just made $100 because the price of your stock went up. This is called appreciation. But the second way that you can make money in the stock market is through something called dividends. So at the end of the year, some companies have a lot of cash in their bank account. And when a company has a lot of cash in the bank, there's a few things that they can do with this money. They can save this money for emergencies. They can invest this money back into the company, or they can pay this money back to the investors. They can literally just give it back to you in a cash payment called a dividend. A good company should do all three. So a good mature company is going to save some money for emergencies. They're going to keep investing in their growth. They're going to hire more employees. They're going to open more offices. They're going to open more stores. And then they want to reward their investors, their shareholders, people like you for investing in and believing the company. So this is where you have to understand what stage a company is in to be able to pay out a dividend. Because if we're talking about a small startup growth company, well, this company's goal is probably not going to be to reward their investors because their goal right now is to get as big as possible, as fast as possible. So what they're going to be doing is not saving their money. What they're going to be doing is not paying this money out to the investors. What they're going to be doing is taking all of their cash and more through debt and other investments, and they're going to be reinvesting it back into their company. They're going to want to get more users. They're going to want to get more customers. They're going to want to open more stores. So smaller startup companies are not going to be paying out dividends because they want to get as big as possible, as fast as possible. And every dollar that they have is going to be going right back into their company. But some companies, your more mature companies or larger companies are going to have this extra cash pile because they're already very large. And at the end of the year, they're going to have a huge profit. 
And if they want to pay this money out to their investors, one way they can do that is through dividends. It's an actual cash payment that you get without even selling your stock. Now again, there's a couple ways that you can get exposure to these dividends. You can go out and you can individually invest in companies that are paying out high dividends, or you can invest in a dividend paying ETF. So if you invest in a company that's paying out a high dividend, well now the pro is you'll be able to get a high dividend, and if you invest in a good company, the value of your company will go up. But now the risk, is if this company starts to tank, if they are on the verge of bankruptcy, if they start losing money, well then they're gonna be forced to cut their dividend and you can see the stock price crash. The advantage of an ETF now is now you don't have to worry about trying to find the perfect company again because the ETF is gonna give you exposure to a whole bunch of different high dividend paying companies. And now if one company tanks or goes bankrupt, you'll be okay because you're getting exposure to a wide range of companies. The con here is you're not gonna get the highest possible dividend because some companies are gonna pay a higher dividend than others. And your returns are also gonna be averaged out because some companies are not gonna do well, but other companies are gonna do great. So the goal with an ETF is not to get the best return possible, is to get a slow and steady consistent return through the market. A couple examples of ETFs that are focused on paying you dividends are VYM and RDIV. Again, these two ETFs are in the business of trying to get you high dividends. This is where, again, you have to know what your goal is as an investor. I know I've talked about this at least 100 times on our YouTube channel, which is why if you haven't subscribed to our channel, make sure you do that. But this is where you got to know your goal. Because if your goal is to see your investment portfolio grow as big as possible, then you don't wanna be investing in these high dividend ETFs because these companies are now taking their money and paying it out to the investors instead of taking their money and re investing it back into their company. So what you want to do, if your goal is to see your portfolio grow as big as possible, as fast as possible, is not invest into these dividend paying companies. These ETFs are focused on producing you consistent cash flow. It's not gonna be the highest cash flow possible, but their goal is to give you consistent cash flow that you can count on. Like what we saw happen in the 2020 pandemic was a lot of companies started to struggle. And because of that, lots of companies started pulling back their dividends. And so people who were invested into these companies that were paying out dividends, hoping for consistent cash flow, were then all of a sudden, almost overnight, left with no more cash flow coming in because lots of companies cut their dividends. And so the whole idea here is to get a safer, which also means lower return, but a safer, more consistent dividend income. The next type of ETF that you may want to consider investing in are emerging market ETFs. The whole idea behind this is, well, now you want to diversify your money outside of just the United States because the reality is every economy has its own struggles and no economy can continue booming at a consistent rate forever. The United States is the leading economy in the world. The United States is the strongest economy in the world, but some people are naturally worried that another company is going to come around and their economy is going to grow bigger than the United States. Or they're also thinking that smaller countries around the world are growing faster than the United States right now, which makes sense because smaller companies grow faster than bigger companies. When you're this large, big behemoth of a company, it's much harder for you to invest in innovation and grow much bigger because you're already very large. But if you're a small company, well, now you have the ability to grow way bigger faster because you're small, and so you have a lot of opportunity to grow. It's the same with this here. When you're investing in emerging markets, the whole idea is you're taking on a little bit more risk because you're investing in new countries, things like China and India and Brazil. And what you're hoping for here is that these smaller countries are gonna see economies that are gonna grow faster because they're smaller and they have the opportunity to grow bigger. Plus, you naturally have some people that are a little bit worried about the long-term health of the United States economy so they want to diversify some of their money outside of just the United States economy. And one way that you can do that is by investing your money into emerging market ETFs because this gives you exposure to the economies of different countries around the world. Again, a couple examples of this would be VMO and IE. Um, G. These are two different ETFs that give you exposure to emerging markets. Now again, this is where you want to do a little bit of your own research and see which countries each ETF is investing in and see what you'd rather have. Do you want more of an exposure to China or do you want more exposure to South Korea? And so you kind of just got to figure out what's important to you because this ETF is going to give you more exposure to China. This ETF is gonna give you exposure to a broader range of countries. But now we're just getting into the details because in either case, you're gonna be getting exposure to emerging markets and emerging countries around the world to give you some diversity outside of just the United States itself. The fifth type of ETFs that you may wanna consider investing in are innovation ETFs. 
We are in the innovation age right now where technology is growing and innovating way faster than we've ever seen happen before. I mean, for all the 80s and 90s babies out there, you probably remember that when you were a kid, the internet wasn't what it was today. When you had to go on the internet back when you were a kid, you had to make sure that your mom or your dad wasn't on the phone because you had to go through dial up and anytime you went on the internet, it was a You remember that whole sound bite that you had to go through to get on the internet? Well now, look at how far we've come with innovation. And so if you want to invest your money into the future of innovation, then you can look at innovation ETFs. So some of the most popular innovation ETFs are managed through the ARK Fund, which is managed by somebody named Kathy Wood. And Kathy Wood is now a famous investor because of the returns that she's gotten her investors. And just a disclaimer, I do have my own money invested in a handful of different ARK funds. But the whole idea behind these ARK funds, their symbols are all ARK, A-R, K and then something like ARK K is their flagship innovation fund. If you put in a G here, it's the genome fund. If you put in an F here, it's the FinTech fund. They have a fund for space exploration. They have a fund for a lot of different things in the innovation space. You can just go onto the website and see the different funds that they are. But again, the whole idea here is you are trying to get some exposure into the innovation side of the world. Another thing that you want to understand about these is that these funds also come with their own fair share of risk because you're investing in a lot of smaller companies and a lot of startup companies. And these funds are also more on the actively managed side, which means that you have people actively working to try to find the best companies to invest in. And so your expense ratio, remember we talked about that a little bit earlier in this video, is gonna be a little bit higher here because now you're actively paying somebody to help manage this fund. But if you're one of those people that wants to be invested into the innovation side of things, into the newer companies, into the newer technology, and you wanna hope that one of these smaller companies takes off, well then some of these ETFs might be right for you. The sixth place where you may wanna consider investing to get money in ETFs are REIT ETFs. I didn't write the word ETF. REIT ETFs. And what a REIT is, is a real estate investment trust. So for all of my real estate people that want to get exposure to real estate on the stock market, this can be a way for you to get exposure to that by investing your money in REITs. When you invest your money into a REIT, you're investing your money into a company that invests in real estate or that invests into mortgages. So you're not getting direct exposure to the real estate per se, but you're investing in the company that invests in real estate so the whole idea is if real estate goes up or if real estate is really booming, well, now this company is going to be booming because it's investing in real estate and you're investing in that company. So it's not a direct investment in real estate. It's an investment in the company that invests in real estate. A couple examples of REIT ETFs would be VNQ and IYR. Now, the thing that makes REITs interesting is REITs are required by law to follow something called the 90% rule, which says that REITs are required to pay out 90% of their taxable income or their profits to their shareholders, people like you, through dividends. And so a REIT's income comes through rental income because these REITs own these rental properties, these investment properties, and they make money from rent. And then after they pay all their expenses, their management fees, their property insurance, their utility bills, their property taxes, their other fees. Once they pay all their fees, then they take the rest of this income and 90% has to be paid out to people like you, shareholders through dividends. An ETF's job again is to minimize the risk for you. So now instead of you trying to find the best REIT to invest in, now you can invest in a REIT ETF that we get exposure to a whole bunch of different REITs that we don't have to worry about trying to find the perfect REIT to invest in because REITs do have a lot of volatility, especially the ones with the higher dividend yields. And this brings me to the seventh type of ETF that you might want to consider investing in, which are your growth stock ETFs. These are your companies that are trying to grow as big as possible, as fast as possible. And then within these growth stocks, you have your large growth stocks and your smaller growth stocks. Your larger growth stocks are a little bit more mature. These are your companies that might be making profits, that might be paying out small dividends, but they're still really investing in their growth they're still investing a lot in innovation because they still want to grow bigger. So the first example of this would be investing in something like QQQ. So QQQ gives you exposure to the NASDAQ, which is essentially the 100 largest companies which are not financial. So this would be companies like Amazon and Apple and Microsoft and Tesla. A lot of these companies are tech companies, but when you're investing in QQQ, you're getting exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies, which many of them are in the tech space. On the other hand, you also have the small cap growth stocks where you can get exposure through something like SY, 
SYLG. So SYLG invests into the smaller cap growth companies, and these are gonna be a lot of companies that you might not have heard of. A couple popular ones are things like Crocs and maybe MicroStrategies, but the goal with both of these ETFs are to give you exposure to these growth type of companies. One gives you exposure to the larger cap ones. These are gonna be more of the companies that you've already heard of. This one gives you exposure to the smaller cap companies, the smaller companies that are really fighting to become much bigger. Remember, more risk comes with more potential return, but you also have more chances to lose your money. This again goes back to your goal. What do you want? More risk comes with more potential return, but it also comes with more risk. Less risk compared to this comes with less potential return, but also less risk. Now, the key for any of these investing strategies to work that I discussed is you have to stay consistent and you want to keep investing your money, whether it's every week or every month. You want to keep investing your money into these ETFs. That way you can continue to build your portfolio of these ETFs. That way you can keep fueling the fire. And then you want to make sure that your fire has time to grow. The best way to build wealth in the stock market is to leave your money in the stock market for the long term because the people that make the most money in the stock market are the people that invest for the long term. And remember, if you do want to learn more about investing your money in the stock market and some of the different stock market strategies out there, we got a free guide to investing your money in the stock market in the description below. Everybody says that if you want to become more wealthy, you got to work to climb your way up the corporate ladder. But that is one of the worst ways to increase your wealth, and I'm going to show you why. Growing up in a traditional Indian house, good grades was very important, and I assumed that your grades were linearly correlated with the amount of money that you were going to make. Better grades, more wealth. I used to believe that if I got good grades, I'd be able to get a good job, which is true. So if I got better grades, I'd be able to get a better job. That's partially true. And if I got even better grades, I'd be able to make even more money. Now, that's not so true. Let me give you an example to show you what I mean. We'll talk about the Coca-Cola company with 2021 numbers. In 2021, the average worker in Coca-Cola employee made somewhere between $30,000 to $180,000 a year. This is from the people working in the factories to the drivers, all the way up to people working in the headquarters, the people that are the financial people, the directors, and all of that. You made somewhere between $30,000 to $180,000 a year. Now, if you were to climb up the corporate ladder in this level, you could work your way up from $30,000 to $50,000, maybe seventy. dollars If you go to the headquarters, now you can work to eighty, dollars hundred, hundred fifty, dollars up to $180,000 a year. Now, if you want to make more than this, you could at Coca-Cola, but now you're going to have to move away from just being a worker to now being what I call a thinker. Thinkers are typically your C-level executives. These are not people who are working in the company, they're working on the company. And in 2021, the CEO of Coca-Cola made $24.8 million. His name is James Quincy. Now, yes, he had to go to work at Coca-Cola every single day to earn this money. He made a lot of money, but he's not working every single day to bottle up the Coca-Colas and do all that work. He's thinking of how do I grow the company, what direction to take the company, what ideas can we come up with, and how to lead the company. So he's working on the company, not in the company. The workers are working in the company. Now, the difference here is when James Quincy made this $24.8 million, that's not all cash that he got in his pocket. That was part cash and part equity, meaning some stock in the company. This is where climbing the corporate ladder ends. For 95 to 98% of people, climbing the corporate ladder is right here. Then you have another percent or so of people that do this, that make it up to the C-level executive, and you have very few of those people. But then, if you look outside of the corporate ladder, you have the wealth ladder. That same year in 2021, Warren Buffett, who is an owner of the Coca-Cola company, he owns a lot of the stock, he made over $700 million in dividends. This is cash that he got in his pocket, and he didn't have to go to work at Coca-Cola every single day. He got the 700 some million dollars because he just owned the company, and he got the profits from the company. Now, there's two points that make this even more interesting. The first point is, who do these people, the thinkers, have their duty towards? Because these thinkers, when they're working every single day, their duty is not to take care of their customers. Their duty is not to take care of their employees. Their duty is to take care of their owners. This is the way that our system works because the thinkers, the C-level executives, have a fiduciary duty to increase the share value of their corporation, aka the C-level executives have a duty to increase the stock price. Who does that benefit? It doesn't benefit the workers unless you're taking a piece of your paycheck and you're buying some stock in your company, or unless your company is giving you some stock in the company, but otherwise the changing stock price doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect these people unless you get equity, but it does affect these people. 
the thinkers are working to increase the wealth of the owners. So now, what does this mean? The system benefits these people. The second reason why this is so important to understand is because of taxes. When you are a worker here, you are a W-2. You're getting a salary, and this means you are going to pay the highest tax rates because our tax code categorizes income in three ways. You have earned income or ordinary income, that's the money you make from your job. You have portfolio income and passive income. Both portfolio and passive income, which is investment income, come with lower tax rates and more tax deductions. So now, you as the W-2 in this case, will be paying somewhere between 15% to 30% in taxes depending on what state you live in and depending on how much money you make. But for a rough idea, you're going to be paying 15 to 30% in taxes for federal and state taxes. If you're making big bucks because now you're the head honcho, you're making that CEO salary, well now guess what, you're going to be paying 39 to 52 percent of this income in taxes because when you're the CEO you're still an employee you're still getting a big W-2 income so you're gonna pay high tax rates but now as the owner when you get this money in dividends the top tax rate here is 20 percent there are some exemptions where you might have to pay a few extra percent but in general the top tax rate for your investment income today is 20 percent Meaning, not only can you earn more money, not only do you not have to go to work every single day in the headquarters, but you are working and doing something else, making more money, potentially, and also paying less money in taxes. This is why you want to do more than just trying to climb the corporate ladder, but you want to also own a piece of the corporate ladder as well. Now, how do you own it? You can buy it or you can build it. If you want to buy it, this is how you can start being an investor. You can start doing this with as little as $100. If you are an investor, you want to stay up to date on what's happening in the financial markets. That's why I created Market Briefs as a completely free resource to keep you up to date on what's happening in the markets. It's an easy to read resource. You can read it in less than five minutes every morning. And every day, my team will give you a simple breakdown of what's happening in the financial markets. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I'll put the link to how you can join Market Briefs down in the description below. The other option, if you don't want to buy it, is you can build it. This means now building the company. Now, building something like Coca-Cola or any other company isn't easy. You have to be an operator. But this is where you have to understand that everybody in America, in this economic system, should be a business owner. However, that does not mean everybody should be a business operator or a person who is running a company. Now, what does that mean? Well, if most people are not running or operating companies, but everybody should be an owner, that means everybody can be an investor. Everybody can do this by buying it. That means now taking the money you make here, a piece of it, every time you get paid, and moving some of this money here. It's the system where now you want to own a piece of our system. And now when you do that, you're not just working to climb the corporate ladder because that's what you're doing at your job. Your labor is you working to climb the corporate ladder. You're working at your company every single day to make more money. But now the question is, why are you trying to earn more money? If you're just earning more money to buy nicer things, you're doing it the wrong way. That's what the majority of people do. The majority of people make more money to buy more things. That is a guaranteed route to being broke. If you really want to become wealthy, you want to be working to make more money. That way, you can own more assets. That means you're working to earn more money here. That way, you can put more of that money here. When you put your money here, now you own the asset. Now you have the workers in the company that are working to increase your wealth. These people are working these people to make these people richer. Now, you're already this person. Now, you need to take the money you're making here and put that money here. That way, you can become wealthy yourself. The stock market has made becoming an owner here much more accessible. And now, thanks to digital brokerages, you can start investing in stocks like this with as little as $100, even less sometimes. Now, if you don't want to invest in public companies, you can also look at investing in startup companies. It's the same concept, but it's riskier because, well, most companies will fail. Most startups fail. Nine out of 10 or eight out of 10 startups fail. So you got to understand the risk versus reward. And then the third very common option to do this would be by investing your money in real estate because when you invest your money in real estate, now you're building equity, not in a company, but you're building equity in these rental properties. And now you get paid this. 
not with profits from the business, but with profits from the rental property. There are five big money lies that are keeping so many people poor. And I can virtually guarantee that every single one of you watching this video have heard some variation of these money lies before. So what I wanna do is I wanna start by going over what these money lies are so you understand them. And then number two, I wanna go over what you can actually start doing with your money today with actionable step-by-step -step things that you can start doing right now that we can actually start building real wealth for yourself regardless of where you are with your money today. So let's start by going over what these money lies are. Number one is you need a certain degree in order to become wealthy. Number two is that BGBC is the reason why you're poor. That's your boss, the government, big banks, and corporations. That these are the things that are keeping you poor. Number three is that you need money to make money. Number four is that money is bad or evil or taboo. You can put whatever you want in those quotes right there. And then number five is that there's just one path to become wealthy. Starting with this, that you need a certain degree to become wealthy. Many of us grew up hearing this. I did too. I grew up being told that if I wanted to become successful, there was only one way to do that, and that was by becoming a doctor. But if you look at some of the most successful and financially richest people in the world, well, many of them didn't get there by just climbing the corporate ladder. They worked to do something different. They worked to either build a business or they worked to buy assets. That's where wealth is built. Your wealth is built through your financial education, not just your school education. Now, having a bigger income can help, but the real key to becoming wealthy is what do you do with your money? And we're going to be talking about that. Number two is that your boss, the government, banks, or corporations are keeping you poor. Look, you can blame other people all day and night long, but at the end of the day, it is up to you to determine what you do with your money. It's up to you to determine how you spend your money. It's up to you to determine how you invest your money, and it's up to you to determine how wealthy you become. You can blame everybody else in the world. You can blame your mom, your dad, your cousin, Uncle Bunty, Cousin Bunty, whatever you want. But until you start taking responsibility for your finances, it does not matter. You can blame everybody else in the world. It's you that's keeping yourself poor there. Number three is that you need money to make money. That's a lie. You need money to grow your money. You want to go out and start buying real estate. You want to go out and start investing in stocks. You want to go out and start buying businesses. It takes money to go out and invest your money to grow your money, but you don't need that money to actually make your money. If you want to go out and start earning money, what you need is you need the right work ethic. You need to be willing to take risks. You need to be willing to learn. You need to be willing to put in the work. If you have that, you can go out and make money. And then once you get the money, that's when you can use that money to actually grow your money. It takes money to grow your money. You don't need that money to actually get the money. Number four is that money is bad. Look, at the end of the day, Money is just a piece of paper. It doesn't have emotions. It's not good, it's not bad. It just amplifies who you are. If you give a good person more money, they have a tool to do more good. If you give a bad person more money, they have a tool to do more bad. That's why we need more good people with money. Money is emotionless, it's just pieces of paper. And number five is that there's just one path to wealth. You hear this, the same thing with religion all the time. There's only one path to God. Well, let me tell you something about money, okay? Because we're not a religious channel. When it comes to money, there is not one path to wealth. If somebody's coming here and they're telling you, you have to go out and invest in real estate if you want to become wealthy, that is the only path to becoming wealthy, they are selling you something. If somebody tells you, you have to be investing in dividend paying companies if you want to become wealthy, that is the only path to wealth, is to build a dividend cash flow portfolio. They're selling you something. And this is where I want you to understand, you have some people that have become incredibly wealthy by investing in real estate and never touching a stock. You have some people that have become incredibly wealthy by investing in stocks, never touching real estate. You have some people that have become incredibly wealthy through entrepreneurship who have never touched real estate or stocks. There's not one path to wealth. You gotta find the right strategies, the right options for you. And this is why I always say, don't just blindly follow a random guy on YouTube. You gotta figure out what's right for you because that's what financial education is all about. So now, if these are the five lies that keep so many people poor or broke financially, what do you need to actually do? And you can really complicate this, but it comes down to three main keys. Key number one is you gotta work to spend less money. Key number two is you gotta work to earn more money. And the key number three is you take the money that you're not spending and you're gonna work to invest like crazy. Now, before we jump into this, I do wanna let you know that if you stick with me until the end of this video, I'm gonna show you how you can get a copy of my team's ebook, How to Build Wealth as an investor for free. So if you wanna get this ebook for free, just stick with me until the end of this video. Now, let's start by going over how do you actually put this in action and how do you start building wealth for yourself? One thing that a lot of people really get confused here is they assume that becoming wealthy has to be really difficult and really complicated and the money management has to be this really intense process, but it really doesn't. It's kind of like building your health. You can get really into the weeds and the nitty gritty of how do you become healthy. You can look into at what incline do you need to walk on your treadmill? What does your heart rate 
need to be, how many hours you need to sleep a night, how do you breathe in the mornings, what do you eat during each hour of the day. I mean, you can get very technical when it comes to your health. But at the end of the day, if you want to become more healthy, just eat less calories and exercise a little bit more. And then you can start working towards that. And as you get more into it, then you can start getting a little bit more technical, a little bit more nitty gritty. It's the same thing with money. It becomes very overwhelming when you start to enter the world of financial education because everybody's bombarding you with all these strategies and all these things you need to do. And now it becomes a whole new full-time job of how do you manage your money? How do you spend your money? How do you invest your money? Where do you put your money to work? How should you be earning money? It becomes very overwhelming. But at the end of the day, there's three things you gotta remember if you wanna become wealthy. It really just comes down to this. You gotta spend less, you gotta earn more, then you gotta invest the difference, invest like crazy. So now, how do you actually put it into action? What are things that you can start doing right now? Well, starting with spending less. You have to understand why are we working to spend less? Because I think a thing that people get really confused is, I want to earn money to have nice things. I don't want to just cut back on my expenses. And you're right. The goal is to be able to have whatever stuff you want, but the goal is to be able to afford this stuff. And at the very least, what you want to do is you want to create a cash buffer for yourself. If you do not have $2,000 saved up in a savings account, not to go out and buy a TV, not to go out and buy a vacation, but saved up to protect you against an emergency, you are in a financial danger zone. So the very first thing you got to do before you do anything else, Go out and save $2,000 ASAP. And that means if you don't got $2,000 saved up, don't go out and eat at restaurants. Don't go out and do anything. Stop buying stuff completely. Don't go to the mall. You need to go out and save $2,000 right now because you are in a danger zone because what happens when you don't have at least $2,000 saved up, this is the very bare minimum. If you don't got $2,000 saved up, well, something's gonna happen. Maybe something's gonna happen to your car. Maybe something happens to your apartment. Maybe something happens to your home. Maybe something happens to your kid. Maybe something happens to your health. And now you gotta pay money to fix that thing. And if you don't got the money to pay for that thing, now you gotta go into debt to fix that thing. Now, not only do you have to pay that money back, but you gotta pay that money back plus interest. So now you start living in the cycle of your work and money just to pay back yesterday's bills or last year's bills. And when you're always working just to pay back yesterday's bills, you never have a chance to build tomorrow's future. And so you gotta start by saving at least $2,000 then. Once you got the $2,000 saved up, the next thing you gotta do is you gotta work to pay down your high interest debts. This is things like your credit card debt as fast as possible. And the reason why is because your credit cards are charging you 15, 18, 21, 25, sometimes 28% a year in interest. Now the reason why that's so significant is because here, when we talk about investing your money like crazy, when you're going to put your money into the stock market, if you're going to buy rental properties, now you're trying to get something like a five to 10% return on your money. Those are your goals as an investor. Those are considered good general returns. But if you're paying 15, 20, 25, 30, 30% in interest to your credit card company, but you're trying to get a five to 10% return here, you are losing in this game of money because you're trying to get a five to 10%, but you're paying out 20% or 25%. And that's why when you have this type of credit card debt, it is literally like shackles that is holding you back from ever becoming successful. And that's why a lot of people start blaming people like corporations and banks for keeping them in this situation. But this is where now you got to stop blaming them and you got to stop playing the same game. And that means you got to stop spending money. You got to stop trying to flex on Instagram. You got to stop buying the things that got you into the situation in the first place. Because let me tell you something. Nobody put a gun to your head to go out and buy that Gucci's belt. Nobody put a gun to your head to go out and drive a Beamer. Nobody put that gun to your head to go out and buy that expensive stuff. And this is where now you're going to have to start letting go of some of these expensive things. And this is difficult because, well, people are going to think you lost your mind. When you start making these tough financial decisions, people look at you like you're the crazy one. What do you mean you don't want to go to the Gucci store? What do you mean you don't want to go to the club? What do you mean you don't want to go to the bachelor party? What do you mean you don't want to go on the vacation? What do you mean that you don't want to go out to eat with me on Thursday night? And these are the tough things that you got to start by making the sacrifices. Now the goal is not to make sacrifices for the rest of your life. The goal is to start kickstarting the process because if you don't have this type of basic financial foundation built, you could never build upwards. You have a lot of people that don't have this that are just like, well, where do I put my money? What stock should I buy? 
How can I double my money really quickly? And those are the people that end up losing money in the stock market, that keep bleeding money here and wonder why they'll never become wealthy, and they just keep hating their boss, their government, the banks, corporations. They hate the entire system because they don't understand what to do with their money. And this is where now I want you to take a breath and understand the first step is you got to control your own spending. And that means if you have a spending problem, you got to sit down with your spouse if you have one, and you got to figure out how you can solve this. Now, you can watch as many videos as you want about how to do it. At the end of the day, you just got to stop spending money. Okay, if you don't need it to survive, stop spending money on it. If it is a luxury, see if you can sell it or downsize. Downsize your car, downsize your apartment, downsize your home, downsize whatever you can, sell some stuff, and stop spending the money, that way you have extra money here. Then, when it comes to earning more money, this one is a little tricky because depending on your personality and your mindset and your attitude towards your work, either this is going to be very difficult or it's going to be not that difficult. For most people, if you're working a job, if you don't like what you do, this is going to be very difficult because that means you might be, you have to work harder. Maybe that means you have to get a second job. Maybe that means you have to get a new career change. And it just seems like work. And this is where I think it's important to understand that there are ways to find a career that make you feel fulfilled. And the interesting thing about this is when you do something that makes you feel more fulfilled, you're gonna have way more income potential. And I can give a little example of this because I'm an attorney. I'm a licensed attorney, I don't work as an attorney, but I am a licensed attorney. And one of the most difficult periods of my life and the one of the most boring periods of my life and one of the most periods where I was sleeping more than ever was when I was studying for the bar exam, when I was studying to become a licensed attorney. I didn't want to be an attorney. I went to law school to make my parents happy because I didn't become a doctor. So I made this compromise that I'll just go and become an attorney. Well, I go to law school. I did good or I did okay. I passed law school. I uh, actually, actually did pretty decent in law school, but I, I uh, then had to take the bar exam, which is a very difficult exam. You study for months to take this bar exam. And it was so draining because I knew this wasn't what I wanted to do. I knew that I was not going to practice as a traditional attorney and I just had to get through this process and I was spending so much of my time, energy and just brain effort trying to learn something that just wasn't that important to me at that time. So it was tough. I was sleeping a lot and it was just tough. But now when I work, when I work for Briefs Media, my company, when I do videos for Minority Mindset, I can get up excited. And I can work a lot longer and not feel drained. I don't feel that same burnout that I did when I was studying for the bar exam. And it's because I actually enjoy what I do. The whole purpose of this rant was essentially, if you want to be able to earn more money, many times that it requires you now to, number one, work harder. And then number two, work smarter. You have a lot of people that say, don't work hard, work smart. That's stupid as well. You have to be willing to work hard. Anybody who tells you that you can make six figures a year by doing nothing except sitting on the laptop is selling you a program. It's hard work, okay, to earn more money. Now, how do you go out and earn more money? This one, again, is going to depend on you. And if you are an employee, maybe that means a career change. Maybe that means working up in your company. Maybe that means getting a second job. But for those of you who are not that employee-minded, maybe you don't want to be an employee. Maybe you're an employee that wants to get out of that uh, system. Maybe you are an employer. Maybe you are an entrepreneur already. This is where now you got to find something that you can enjoy doing and monetize at the same time. I never really worked a traditional job. I've been fortunate for that. I've always been uh, that entrepreneurial mind. I graduated law school and then I never worked as an attorney because my business was uh, fortunate enough to be able to support me. But for me, the thing that had helped me earn more was working hard in my business. Number two, learning consistently how to grow and scale. And then number three, as we started to make money, to take the money and pour it back into the business. And this one is tough and I'll tell you exactly why. Because on the internet, you have this thing where when people make money, you gotta show it off. Now, this is for all kinds of people across all incomes. It doesn't matter if you are an employee or an employer or a self-entrepreneur or a solo entrepreneur. Everybody feels this need to show it off. And then the internet digital entrepreneur space, people feel the need to really just show off the numbers. Oh, first time I made six figures. And when I made six figures, I bought this car. When I made half a million dollars a year, I bought this. When I made $700,000 a year, I did this. When I made a million dollars a year, I did this. And I'll tell you that the first time I made a million dollars, the first time my tax return showed them a business made a million dollars, 
I walked away with $20,000. That was the money that I took for myself. The other $980,000 went right back into the business. Now, I could have taken out way more. I could have taken a whole lot more, bought a nice car, gone on a whole bunch of expensive vacations, done a bunch of nice fancy things and expensive things. But that's not what I wanted to do because I wanted to build a bigger business. So, if you're working to earn more money, you got to just understand, you got to be willing to invest in your income. That's really what ultimately comes down to. If you're an employee, that means investing in how do you earn more money. Maybe that means taking classes on how you can get a better job. Maybe that means getting a career change. Maybe that means getting a certificate. Maybe that means working harder to earn more money. Whatever it might be, you got to start investing in that income. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Now, I don't have a whole bunch of experience here because I never really worked as an employee, so I don't want to go deeper into that side. But even as an employer, same concept. If you're working to build your own business, if you're working to build your own income, you got to be willing to invest in your income. Take classes, get coaching, get consulting, go out and keep learning, trying things, risks. I mean, the problem is you will lose money with some of these things, but the goal is to be able to increase that income by learning and learning how you can increase that income. Now, as you spend less and you earn more, the fastest way to increase your wealth is to increase your income faster than you increase your spending, period. The reason why so many Americans are broke is that anytime you get a raise, you also inflate your lifestyle. I mean, if you ask out 100 Americans, what would help you in a financial situation today? All 100 of them would say, oh man, if I just got a $10,000 raise, all of my financial problems would be solved. I'd have more money to invest, more money to save, more money to buy groceries and whatnot. But what we've seen happen statistically, and I'm not just saying this, I'm saying statistically, is that when the vast majority of Americans go out and make more money, they end up in a bigger financial hole. How do we know this? Because when Americans go out and they get more money, they go out and they buy a faster car, they buy a bigger home, or they go on a vacation to celebrate. And then many times now, when you make more money, the bank also looks at you and they say, oh, now you make more money, huh? How about another line of credit? How about another credit card? How about a bigger debt line? You qualify for more debt as you make more money as well, which makes it easier for you to go out and spend more money you don't have also. And that's why so many people end up in a bigger financial hole as they start to make more money, which is why as you start to make more money, keep your lifestyle small for a little while. I call it like a six month delay. Don't increase your lifestyle at all for six months. Just take that extra money and invest it. And then when you get the next pay raise, well, now you start living off of the previous pay raise. That way now you can keep increasing how much money you invest. I mean, that's a simple way that you can just accelerate how much money you invest is that when you start making more money, do not inflate your lifestyle. That will allow you to increase your wealth much faster. And unfortunately, most people don't do that. So now you start earning more money, you start spending less money, so you have more money to invest. Now what do you do? You gotta invest this money like crazy. I call this a decade of sacrifice. Because many people assume that when you start investing, you're gonna be able to reap the rewards of your investments tomorrow or next year. That's not how it works. It's like planting a farm. You can plant the farm right now, but you're not gonna get your fruits tomorrow. You might have to wait a year to really start seeing the, the rewards of what you planted, maybe even a few years, depending on what you're planting. And this is where now you gotta understand, investing is a long-term game. The people that build the real wealth with investments are not people that are investing for six months, or even six years. We're talking about for a decade or more. And I call that a decade of sacrifices because it takes time to number one, start putting this system to work to spend less and earn more, to then put the money here, but then it also takes time to let your money compound and grow. Now, like what I was saying earlier in this video, there are so many ways to invest and they can get very, very, very overwhelming because now you have everybody saying, oh, you got to invest in index funds. No, invest in rental properties. No, invest in ETFs. No, invest in real estate syndicate deals. No, invest in uh, these types of ETF mutual funds or derivatives or options or no, go out and start investing in startup companies. It can get very overwhelming. And now you have all these options. You don't know where to start. But the key is you just got to get started. Stocks, real estate, and businesses have been time-tested to prove and build more wealth than any other asset class. So now, just figure out what are you interested in and where are you willing to start. If you want to start investing in the stock market, it requires the least barrier to entry and the lowest amount of money to start. I mean, you can start investing your money in the stock market with as little as a dollar, $10, $100, it doesn't matter. And the nice thing is there are funds, things like ETFs or index funds. I got other videos on my channel that will go over what those are that will give you exposure to things like the total stock market. Because what ends up happening next is people will say, oh, what company should I invest in? You start going to Google, 
what's the next hot stock? What's the next Google? What's the next Amazon? And now when you do that, you're trying to find the next hot company. And now you turn into a trader trying to find the next hot flip, the next hot stock. And that's why so many people end up losing money is because when you start investing in companies without understanding what the company is or what the fundamentals are or without actually trying to invest for the long term, well, now you're one of the people that ends up losing when the markets start to go down. And you got to understand markets don't go straight up. But if you just invest in the stock market and you keep putting more money into the stock market for the course of a decade or a couple decades, well, what we've seen happen through the last century is that the stock market has gone up despite market crashes, despite recessions, because we've seen a market crash or recession pretty much every decade for the last century. And yet the stock market has still risen despite every market crash and recession. And so now, if you don't know how to do the research, that's okay. You can just put your money into the stock market. There are funds that give you exposure to the S&P 500. That's the largest 500 companies in the stock market. There are funds that give you exposure to the Dow Jones. There are funds that give you exposure to the NASDAQ. There are funds that give you exposure to technology companies. There are funds that give you exposure to real estate companies. There are funds that give you exposure to international companies. So now, instead of you trying to go out and find the perfect company, you can just invest in an industry. Now, if you want to get more involved, fine. Now you can start understanding how do you research companies? How do you analyze a company? What is the fundamental analysis? What is a company's moat? What is a company's real internal valuation? What is a company's actual profit? How much has the profit have been growing? How has the revenue has been growing? Who is the executive structure? Or what is the executive structure of a company? Now you can start digging a little bit deeper. Now maybe you're interested in that, maybe you are not. But, but depending on where you are in this investment analysis game, you got to make your decisions accordingly. Just like that with real estate. You got to decide if real estate investing is right for you or not. I like investing in real estate. Maybe you'll hate it. Maybe you'll love it. It takes more money to get started. It takes more work to get started. You got to find the right team. You got to deal with bad property managers. You have to deal with bad contractors. Now you can get great returns. You can get great tax benefits. There's a lot of benefits to investing in real estate, but not everybody should or can be a real estate investor. It's like not how everybody should or can be an entrepreneur. Just like that with businesses. You got to understand, well, if you don't want to start a business, do you want to go out and buy a business? It takes more work, takes more time, but it's not for everybody. And this is where, again, you can go deep into the rabbit hole of all the different investment options, but the key is we just got to get started. The reason why so many people don't become wealthy isn't because they made the wrong investment. It isn't because they have the wrong expense ratio in their funds. It isn't because they didn't do all the right analysis. It's because they are not investing. The key is you got to just get started. Once you get started, you can start making adjustments because now you start to understand, oh, okay, maybe I want to more invest more to this. Maybe I don't want to invest more to this. Once you have more skin in the game, you naturally become more involved. But the key is you got to start putting your money to work. Now, in the beginning of this video, I promised you that if you stuck with me until the end, I'm going to show you how you can get a copy of this ebook, How to Build Wealth as an Investor for Free. Now, the way you can get a copy of this is I got a link for you down in the description below. We're going to go to briefs.co slash ebook. And in this ebook, we have tons of information starting with how do you build the mindset of an investor to then how do you start investing your money, different ways to invest your money, how do you generate cash flow, to then how do you spend your money smartly, to then how do you earn more money, to then how do you protect your assets, because let me tell you something, they start making more money, people are going to try to take a piece of that for themselves. So there's a ton of value in this ebook. You can read it for free. All you gotta do is click the link down in the description or go to briefs.co slash ebook. And we also have tons of videos on my channel that will go over different investing things that you need to know to help build your financial education as well. Because when you save your money, now you have this big bank account, hopefully, that you can now use to go and buy things with. The only problem with that is if you could go out and save $100,000, you might feel rich. But $100,000 today is not gonna buy you what $100,000 could 50 years ago and $100,000 in 50 years will not be able to buy you what $100,000 can today. 